Service USA is one of the partnering institutions putting on today's event. I'm joined by uh, JT Yeager of Inartis USA. Hey, JT, how are you doing? Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good. And by Thibaut Skolash of Fruition Sciences. Hey, Thibaut. Hello, Mark. Hello, JT. So today, just a, a brief outline of what we're going to be discussing. Um, after this introduction, we're going to be hearing about a um, about, about Thibaut Skolash's framework for understanding uh, vintages in any wine growing region in the world. Um, Essentially, what this is, is our five periods of plant development. And with this uh, framework, we're allowed to uh, really break down each vintage, understand key metrics to plant performance and wine quality, um, and really get at the main takeaways of a vintage. So Thibaut is going to be walking us through the maintenance of this uh, framework. And simultaneously, he will also be discussing the main uh, takeaways that uh, he and his team have learned from the 2020 vintage. Um, but make sure you're strapped on your seatbelts because he's gonna do this in 15 minutes and we're gonna get through it quite quick. Um, and then we are gonna hear from, from JT and JT is gonna outline the commercial trials that he and his team of global scientists have been working on uh, in conducting trials on their, their solution, Blue Vitae. Um, and in doing that, JT is also going to be applying um, the framework, uh, the, the five period framework um, to really show us how we can understand cause and effect relationships all throughout the, the vintage. And particularly our focus today is on heat waves. So we wanna understand how plants uh, are reacting to heat waves and technologies that can help us uh, amend and, and implement uh, vine resiliency. That's really what our, our main goal is today. So um, before everything's over, we're going to have a question and answer session, probably about um, 15 minutes before the end of the, the entire program. And in that context, we'll be taking all of your questions from throughout, um, throughout the broadcast. So um, with that in mind, I believe you all have access to the, the, the chat box and the Q&A function. Um, it's probably a little bit more helpful for us if you post your questions in the Q&A box. If they end up getting posted in the chats, no big deal. But um, we will be going through those questions again after um, the main presentation is over and, and just finding responses to everything. Um, and if you don't want to see the chat function, if it's um, annoying in any way, I think you can toggle it out so that you're just watching uh, the presentation or just watching the presentation and the speakers. Um, so today's webinar is being recorded um, and the slides will be available um, on the Anartis USA website. So both the, the slides and the, the recording will be available on the website, which means there's no need to take really uh, fast technical notes if you don't want to. Um, you're always welcome to come back and check this information out on uh, your own time. Um, so I wanted to start out with a brief description of who we are, who the Vintage Report is. Um, we are a thought leadership symposium, which focuses principally on viticulture and analogy. Um, and in doing what we do, we want to bring together winemakers, grape growers, scientists, and folks from the industry to understand the previous year's harvest. We look at the most recent scientific findings um, we look at adopting the most, the newest and most advanced pieces of technology. Um, and uh, we also uh, look to understand advanced data metrics of what happened in, in the vintage. But key to, to today's conversation is we're really going to be establishing that link between the vintage um, and implementing nuanced pieces of technology. And, and that's, that's really the most exciting component of today's forum. Um, and throughout these sessions, I always encourage our audience to really challenge themselves with the question, how can the lessons of the previous harvest be utilized to enhance vineyard practices and improve wine quality? Um, this is a core question because we want to look back at what happened last year and we want to apply the lessons learned to um, the coming vintage and then in, in growing seasons to come. Um, but that, that's really what we hope to gain from this level of analysis. And so how did exactly we, did we get uh, invited into this awesome forum. Well, um, the Vintage Report, our understanding really stems from 
uh, an advanced understanding of uh, vine water use. And that really comes from our parent company, Fruition Sciences, which is a uh, precision agriculture company based out of Montpellier, France. And um, essential to Fruition's business is um, deploying technologies as a service and really understanding um, key plant metrics. Um, so in, in doing this, we've developed um, periods of plant development, which allow us to um, have a, a, a broader understanding of vine, vine water use variations and grapevine physiology. And then throughout the, the vintage, throughout the growing season, we're gonna be utilizing um, this holistic analysis um, so that we can impact vine and fruit performance and um, improve growing conditions so that we have a, a better wine quality um, in, in the end. And so um, again, we are really hoping to um, tie our framework of understanding um, each vintage with applying a new piece of technology. And today we're gonna to be focusing on Blue Vitae. So super excited about that. Um, so today, again, one of our, our principal focuses is, is understanding heat waves. Um, and in our forum in the Vintage Report, um, particularly in 2020, we have been very challenged to analyze and deeply understand the impact of, of heat spikes on viticulture. Um, and this uh, is not exactly a relatively new phenomenon. We have been experiencing an increase of, of heat wave events um, for the past 10 years. And not just here in, in the United States, but on a global level. I'll get to that here in a second. But essentially, this is a very simple graph, and it's just telling us um, heat wave frequency per year. Um, and so there are some years that have uh, a much uh, lower number of heat wave or heat spikes, and such as 2018, a very mild year. Um, but then there are years where we are seeing um, abnormally high uh, spikes in, in, in heat waves. And uh, 2020 was one of those vintages. Um, so we as wine growers are going to be very challenged to find solutions to mitigate heat uh, and heat spikes in years to come. And it's, it's our job really to, to be able to put, to put forward um, these technologies that we can utilize in, in the field. Um, but I mentioned, we've been seeing this on a global level. We do programs all around the world in three different continents. Um, and a, a good data set that we have is from Bordeaux. And so I just wanted to share this one with you. Um, and so while Bordeaux does not have the volume of heat waves um, that we're experiencing on the North Coast, um, that trajectory of increased heat waves is actually more extreme than what we've seen in, um, in Napa. And in fact, that, that, in, that percentage increase in, in Napa from 2011 to 2020 is roughly about 30%. This is 250% what we're looking at. Um, so absolutely, uh, we are seeing the impact of extreme heat on viticulture. This is impacting how the vines grow. Uh, this is impacting how wine quality uh, results. And uh, culturally, it's also impacting this quite a bit as well. Um, but again, today we're gonna be focused on a piece of technology that's gonna allow us to mitigate some of these effects. So um, Thibaut, I am gonna pass it over to you and I'm gonna ask you to outline both your framework for the five periods of analysis and tell us a little bit more about the 2020 vintage. Thanks, Mark. So um, as Mark pointed out, um, the reason why uh, we are here as a vintage report organizations, it's because we developed a method to analyze changes in vineyard performances in response to climate. But as Mark explained, that same method can be used to analyze changes in vineyard performances in response to a specific treatment. And for that, we have uh, laid out key stages throughout the season where we can see the footprint of either climatic pressure or any given uh, modification or treatment uh, on uh, plant uh, performances and fruit performances. So I'm going to essentially explain how this analytical framework can be used to assess the impact of Blue Vitae, Blue Vitae uh, treatment. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to do that by first segmenting the season into 
five uh, different periods. The first period is the vegetative rest that ends with a bud break. And then of uh, physiological changes. So actually the split between each period uh, does not only align with phenological changes, but rather with physiological changes. The period two essentially highlights everything that programs plant architecture and from there define its water needs. The period three starts from the moment in time when the leaf area size is set up until uh, the raison. During that period, essentially, the plant is programming the fruit inerological potential. So together, period two plus period three have a carryover effect on the entire season. Why? Because number one, those two periods early on will impact plant resistance to drought and to heat wave, and I'm going to explain later on what that means. And second, there will be impacting plant ability to ripen the fruit. Then period four is the period characterized by berry, sugar, and water accumulation, while period five characterizes the last aromatic and polyphenolic changes until harvest. So when we started to conceive this talk, the whole idea was, OK, how can we use this analytical framework to validate the impact of a root-based treatment on plant performances through each of those five periods? So let me tell you what we uh, have um, found when uh, using 2020 as a um, support to apply this, this method. First, what is period one in terms of plant? Well, that's when everything is uh, getting in and out of dormancy and vegetative rest stops. This year, it was characterized over the north coast of, Calif of um, Pacific uh, by a very dry and very hot uh, for this time period. Many locations saw a drop of 90% in terms of rain. And this period ends with a bud break. What's interesting to see, so from left to right, you see the last three vintages, and you see this marked decline in terms of cumulated rain. And for now, that's all what I'm going to say. Period two is next and starts with bud break. Period two is very important because it characterizes active leaf area growth. It sees bloom, and depending upon the level of vegetative development, it can go up until almost the raison. But what's important is that at the end of period two, canopy size is set. And in terms of uh, climatic footprint, in 2020, P2 had a high drought index and a high heat accumulation. So the drought index is just a way to monitor how much water demand there is from the atmosphere versus how much water supply there is from, from the rain or from your irrigation, but here from the rain. When we look at period two, how can we segment it as a mean to assess the impact of here a treatment. Well, if the treatment is applied by the end of period one, then we have two key stages where we can see the footprint of a plant changes. First, at the beginning of period two, we know that that's when the root uptake of minerals is the most active, while the second Two thirds of period two is when leaf accumulation of nutrient is the most active. We will see how that uh, applies to our evaluation of uh, the blue vitae treatment. And if we try to look at how this period two has been uh, different in 2020, 
just like Mark was showing, we recorded the frequency of heat wave days. And you see that 2020 is characterized by this uh, ever increasing trend in frequent uh, heat spikes. Whether we look at Napa or we look at Sonoma, you see. In Sonoma, here we not only look at the heat spike days, but we also look at this in index, uh, the drought index, which uh, really characterizes the offset between atmospheric demand expressed in millimeters of water and water supply. So what you get to understand is that the higher the index is, the more pronounced is the drought. In other words, the more there is a high demand not matching enough supply. So it's just a check in balance. And the higher, the worse it is to supply all the water the atmosphere is asking. So you see, you see the trend, not a lot of uh, water and a lot of climatic demand. Period three, it is characterized by uh, its water deficit intensity. And it's very important from a winemaker standpoint because this is the period during which berry size will be set, berry sugar content, and also the polyphenol uh, accumulation potential. By the end of P3, most of the, the stage is, is set. Then we just need to uh, check that the weather and the practices are basically helping the plant to uh, achieve its potential that has been defined by the end of uh, P3. And in 2020, actually, period three was relatively mild. It started a week earlier, but we observed fewer heat waves. What can we learn from assessing plant indices during uh, period three? Well, you see that it starts with the end of active leaf area growth. So it's a very good moment to make leaf area measurements to assess the level of shoot length, shoot diameter in response to the pre-conditioning of the plants during period two. And it's also the starting point where because the drought index can be high, we expect that the plant may have to down regulate its water use. So that is why it makes sense to start monitoring plant water use the moment you enter into period three. And you can keep doing that same analysis in period four and five. Another thing you can do during period three is really take a step back regarding how well the plant has performed in terms of accumulating nutrients. You can do it at the end of period two and you can double check your results in terms of uh, nutrient accumulation uh, right at the end of period three, that is when the raison kicks in. If we look at uh, the conditions, uh, climatic conditions during which uh, plants have uh, developed uh, in period three, we can see that there were, in fact, you see on your right hand side, the number of heat wave days in Napa and Sonoma and in Paso Robles, they are stretching uh, between eight and uh, 15, which is uh, in the norm, rather high for such a small period, but compared to the past, such as 2018, not as stressful from an atmospheric standpoint. So that is something to bear in mind when we analyze the performances of the plant in terms of water deficit during P3. And that's why maybe the water deficit was not as uh, severely uh, limiting um, in 2020, at least. Then we enter into period four. So period four is marked by the coexistence of sources, the leaves, sources of energy, sources of sugar, and sinks, the fruit, where the sugar is uh, loading and uh, deposited. So P4 characterizes the period from start to end of active sugar loading. This has to be uh, really emphasized. We are talking about active loading of sugar inside the berry, which is something different from uh, sugar concentration, which um, is not directly uh, related to active sugar uh, loading into the berry since uh, 
very moisture content can also affect bricks regardless of active sugar loading. In uh, 2020, this period was characterized by extreme heat wave uh, throughout California. What is to learn from assessing plant indices during that period? Well, we have during that period to clearly disentangle two uh, concepts. One is the concepts of atmospheric aridity, which I explained in a minute, while the other one is the concept of uh, drought affecting uh, the level of uh, vine water use. And why are those two concepts very important to disentangle? It's for their implication on uh, plant performances in terms of hydraulic function and their uh, carryover impact on fruit ripening consequences. Atmospheric aridity implies the combination of low relative humidity alongside with high temperature. It is measured in kilopascal, which is a pressure. It's actually technically called the vapor pressure deficit. And this atmospheric measurement represents the water sucking pressure of the air. The higher it is, the more water is sucked out of the plant and out of the fruit and out of animals, really. It, it affects everyone. The catch-22 here is that atmospheric aridity and drought they are both influencing the plant physiological function via the plant leaves. But their relative contributions to changes in plant water use are difficult to tease apart. They both lead to a reduction in the total amount of sugar per berry. And uh, that is to say less sugar per berry than what the plant would physiologically achieve. So monitoring sugar per berry during P4 is a good way to assess either the impact of climate or the impact of a treatment. What did we observe? Well, we observe that in response to those heat spike, sugar loading can actually freeze. So in the past, we used to expect the ripening uh, time profile to be slowing down when it was cooler. But in fact, high temperature and heat waves can also lead to the same impact. When you are lucky, if the combination of atmospheric, high atmospheric aridity is not associated with a high level of water stress, you are in what I call a good cases. You only observe in your vineyard a transient sugar loading freeze which means that your ripening period will stretch out a little bit. And then once the heat wave is over, things get back to normalcy. But in the bad cases, the combination of heat wave and drought leads to irreversible stop in terms of fruit ripening. And during those events, there is actually less sugar per berry, which is technically looking like that. So here I have reported just the profile, the time profile that you will be seeing if you were to monitor the amount of sugar per berry. You see the green profile is a good profile where the heat wave is freezing for a moment, the um, active accumulation of sugar. And then once this red period, this heat wave period is over, you see that the plant recovers and fruit ripening kicks back up again. Whereas when the stress is too much, there is this combined effect of heat spike and, and water use that creates cavitation inside the plant. That is to say there is a disruption of the flow of sugar. You see that even after the heat wave is over, the plant cannot recover. And as a consequence from that, you may still observe that the bricks is rising up, but the physiological changes needed for plants to mature properly are stopped until the end of the season. And that's when you observe shriveling of the fruit, discoloration, aroma, degradation, etc. So that's what we will be watching during P4. And then during P5, this is really the, the icing on the cake. We really get to the latest part of the maturation. At that stage, the plant is uh, hydraulically buffered uh, from the fruit. And really what happens here is the touch up in terms of uh, color accumulation inside the skin. 
So P5 is characterized by the peak of color accumulation. And in 2020, we observed the most extreme heat waves, which we know via uh, their temperatures are actually affecting the uh, aroma profile and the color potential. So the chemistry of the fruit is affected by temperature, while the anatomic feature of the fruit, its volume and its concentration of water is uh, affected by uh, the high atmospheric aridity. So when the vapor pressure deficit is high, you lose volume, so the yield drops, and you increase your bricks, regardless of the physiological ripening. So this will conclude my uh, discussion here. We expect that high temperature during P5, even if everything has been good, uh, will have a negative impact on color maintaining and aroma maintaining. Whereas vapor pressure deficit will, through its impact on the reduction of photosynthetic activity, will lead to a loss of berry volume alongside with an increase in bricks. So my take home message is that if we want to get a convincing demonstration of uh, the benefit of a treatment, well, we have a lot of indices along plant development to test in order to support our conclusions that yes or no, a treatment is working. So JT, at this point, I uh, handing to you to see how you can demonstrate the benefits of your conclusions uh, using this framework. Perfect. Thanks so much, Thibaut. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so just uh, moving on from here, I guess um, I'm, before I jump into the actual uh, trial data and the, and the case studies that we compiled to present to you, uh, I just wanted to give a background as to uh, the group of companies that sort of work together to make the Blue Vita technology uh, work in North America and abroad. Uh, you know, Blue Agri here is our is actually our Italian sister company, and they they're the ones who create the vineyard product line. So I work very closely with their team. Uh, I work for Nardis USA, and we're the main distributors of the product in in North America. And then the last company, or SOP, uh, they actually create the technology that goes inside uh, the the Blue Vita product line that allows the product to work. Um, this company's been around for you know around twenty years, and has many other products like. Uh, in staple crops like corn, soy, and other perennial crop crops like almonds, uh, and they have they actually have some peer-reviewed publications in, in livestock production with uh, UC Davis, Cornell, and the University of Milan, I believe, and there's some uh, pending peer-reviewed publications in, in other staple crop systems. Uh, the venture into vineyards actually occurred about six to seven years ago in in Italy. So moving on from there, um, we do have a global presence. Um, here's just some of the locations in which uh, you know Blue Vitae is being trialed and being used. Um, you know North America, Europe, uh, South America, and uh, South Africa. So um, we've got we have a lot of data collected in many different countries, growing regions, both old old world and new world vineyards. Um, but the, the case studies today, I'm going to go through our, our focus primarily in the North Coast AVA. In, in California. So there's a very a very quick background as to the how the product works. We've got quite a bit of uh, data on sort of our genomic studies on this, um, but I'm just going to go through this relatively quickly for for time time constraints. Um, but generally, just one of the problems uh, with sort of being a plant is you have to stay put. You can't move. So they really rely on um, you know micro microorganisms to make a living in the soils, the surrounding soils. So, uh, you know, plants are dependent really on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the growth of these soil microbes, um, which possess the metabolic machinery to access soil nutrients, um, especially ones that are uh, minimally, minimally bioavailable, like um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, sulfur in particular. Um, but there, you know, really the, the take home message here is there's some really complex interactions that take place in the soil between plant roots and, and sort of these root associated microorganisms. And the soil microbial loop is sort of that reinforcing cycle that uh, results in the emission of these fine lateral roots called secondary roots, uh, ultimately that are uh, responsible for 
nutrient and, and water uptake. And uh, these secondary roots are hugely important for not only the longevity of the vine, but uh, especially for the vine's ability to, to persist through extreme weather events, uh, like, like drought, for example, which, which is something that I'll dive into a bit later. Um, because the vine can better utilize its water, water resource and, and nutrient resource and, and, and very generally be more resilient um, to these events. Um, you know, and obviously, like, like I said, microorganisms are a critical piece of this loop, and uh, the Blue Vitae product line is directly stimula stimulating this root microbial interaction in the rhizosphere. And moving on from that, um, you know, we've done pretty extensive uh, studies in, in grapevine nurseries in both California and Italy to sort of look at this effect of the production of overall root biomass and secondary root production. This, this data I'm showing here or I guess the images that I'm showing here were collected uh, by my colleague, Martina Brogio. It, um, she works for Blue Agri. She's essentially the technical, technical director for Italy, but really she runs, she helps run all of our trials globally. And so this is, um, this is showing the vegetative growth of these, of these vines, uh, young vines uh, in pots. But the point of this is really to show you the overall improvements in rooting biomass. Um, so this is, you know, control on the left and Blue treated on the right, you get the sense of this Im improvement in secondary root pr production, the improvement in the fine root hairs uh, that are ultimately responsible for um, the bulk of nutrient and water uptake. And I just had included another, another image as to the, a different perspective in terms of what that looks like um, for, the, for the grapevine. So that's kind of the 10,000 foot overview um, as to how the product works. Again, we have um, quite a bit of data to to support this, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, I can obviously uh, set a time to discuss that further with you. Um, just moving on now to the case study itself, which is I think why we're here, um, is really as to sort of pull from the data uh, from the North Coast AVA in 2020, um, multiple sort of trials we had um, to get some, to gain some statistical significance in the data. Uh, just moving for, forward from that, you know, here's the sort of data collection and in, in, in reference to that five period framework. And all this slide really aims to show is, is sort of the types of measurements that that sort of will be presented on today, looking at canopy measurements, um, looking at uh, uh, fruit quality measurements, looking at your uh, plant water status, but also looking at uh, thermal imaging too as well and making some assessments from that. And so yeah, period two, uh, and Tivo, please correct me if I'm wrong in, in summarizing this period. Um, but yeah, so this, this period in particular is really important for the programming of, of the vine architecture and sort of future water needs of, of the grapevine. Um, and so moving on from that, I'm gonna look at sort of uh, measurements uh, uh, at bud break in particular, um, but really focusing first on that sort of timing of application. So. Um, you know, Blue Vitae is applied twice a year. Uh, you're looking at sort of bud break and, and, and pre-flowering or pre-bloom, and generally that tends to be between March and April and uh, May, May and June for that second application. Um, <clears throat> this is really the most effective time to stimulate that root uh, microbial root interaction and sort of influence the vine development for the season. And uh, we do see this sort of uh, influence of a multi-year application in the treated vines. Um, which is all the data that I'm showing you today is from a multi-year application. Um, and this is, and, and we actually see uh, uh, the vine's better ability to store nutrients, a higher, uh, higher nutrient status in the treated vines, I think which is one of the main drivers of uh, uniform bud break um, in, in the treated areas. So now looking at sort of uh, a cane and, and sort of how, uh, sort of how typical, I guess, and especially in Cabernet Sauvignon, blind buds are a really common characteristic, especially in cane fruit cab. Um, but in the, in the Blue Vitae treatments, we generally see a significant reduction in the prevalence of these non-sprouted um, shoot positions. And then also we see uh, more, more uniformity of growth of shoots sort of across the cane um, with less variation between growth at sort of the, well, the, the head the head and also the distal end of the cane and, and those, those mid-cane uh, mid uh, positions. 
and I promise I'll show the data. I just kind of I think pictures are also impactful. And then just doing a side by side here, I think this really gives you an idea as to the differences between the two treatments. You know, with multiple multiple years of application, we see this we see that this ape, this characteristic of apical dominance um, is is far less prevalent in the treated area of the vineyard, and the data does suggest this. So here's all of the shoot length data um, for this particular case study, and this equates to generally a 6.5% increase in average shoot length. The X in each one of these um, boxes, uh, blue vitae red being on the right, control on, or I guess blue vitae on the left, control on the right, uh, the X inside of those boxes is the average, and the that line in, in the middle of the box is the median data point. You can actually see that some of the highest measurements are in the controls. Some of the longest shoots are in the control, but a, there's far more shorter shoot measurements too as well. So you get this sense of a decrease in shoot length variability, which ultimately boosts the average of the shoot lengths across, across the vineyard. There's, uh, I think, a more impactful way to look at this data as opposed to just showing all the data on a graph. And that is through a shoot quality designation. Um, so from this chart, I think really the take home is the percentages of, of shoots in terms of the grading parameter. Um, we have you know zero being a non-sprouted shoot or weak shoot position. And then with each subsequent uh, grading parameter moving towards four, we get towards regular growth. And you can see here, there's sort of a lower number of and overall percentage of these non-sprouted shoots or weak shoot positions in the treated. And there's also a higher percentage of these well-developed shoots, you know, grading three and above. And so really the, the purpose of showing this is that there's this increased root biomass and secondary root production that allows for this higher root and shoot functional growth. Um, and that persists sort of, uh, you know, this root shoot functional equilibrium that persists into later in the season. And I will show that data as well. Um, you know, and, and ultimately we see that the, the vine has the potential for improved ability for utilization of this soil nutrient and water resource um, with a more uniformly developed canopy as well. So just moving on from that, I'm gonna move on to sort of period two and three. And again, uh, this is, uh, we, we had measured uh, these certain canopy indexes and certain vine nutritional ind indexes because this is important for uh, peak vine nitrogen demand and when uh, canopy growth maxes out as well. So moving on from that, looking at a similar picture here between uh, the, two, the two treatments. And this is kind of showing, uh, you know, higher, this higher functional equilibrium between root and shoot growth, um, allowing for that average to be moved upwards. We're not causing excessive growth in the treated. Um, in fact, a lot of the longest shoots occur in the control vines, but we're bringing up this, this functional average. Um, you know, and this includes, really includes mechanisms that control sort of the distribution of photosynthates to the different sinks, which are, you know, the shoots, roots, and fruit, um, which is what we'll, we'll discuss a bit more later on the presentation. Um, but really this has implications for overall vine balance. Um, you know, it has Im implications for the vine's capacity to sort of fix carbohydrates, uh, which, you know, are cr created during photosynthesis and sort of accumulate these nutrients for growth. Um, and Ultimately, these, these, these fixed uh, photosynthetic compounds are critical for future ripening um, and also has implications for fruit quality and yields as well. So here's all the data again. I'm not sure how impactful this, this all, showing all the data is, but I think it's just important to, as a talking point. Um, this, the average, comparison of the average, a 28.6% increase in average shoot length. And if you don't look closely enough, you might just assume that we're making the vines more vigorous. And um, this is not the case. It's not due to this excess vigor. Um, it's really due to this general decrease in shoot length variability um, compared to the control. Uh, we actually see a smaller standard deviation in terms of the, the measurements uh, in the treated area. Um, we sort of see this consistent decrease in shoot length variability um, and ultimately, you saw this begins with bud break, and that shifts that overall average canopy size upward. We have far less shorter, thinner shoots. I'm only showing shoot length. We also measure shoot shoot diameter in all of our um, 
all of our uh, vineyard trials. And so we have, we see this general shift upwards um, in, in all of our canopy measurements. So then moving on from there, we did the same shoot quality designation. I just want to bring your attention first and foremost to the blind buds, the zero percentages on the graph. Um, the, the threshold that was established between the client, um, client viticulture team and myself was I believe um, a non-sprouting bud up to 10 centimeters, which I believe is, my conversion is, is, is kind of bad, but I think it's around three inches. Uh, in length, and the, it wasn't a fruiting uh, a fruiting position. So, uh, but then breaking that down into what that means in terms of uh, blind buds uh, is about 1.8 blind buds per vine in the treated, versus about 3.2 blind buds per vine in the control. Um, so nearly half as many. And then you can get an idea, sort of a higher percentage of well-developed shoots, grading of three and above uh, in the treated, and so. I think with this final piece of, of canopy measurement, this gives a clear indication of sort of uh, not only more uniform uh, bud break, but has our uniform uh, canopy growth, bud, bud break and canopy growth, but uh, has implications for more efficient uh, vine in terms of transpiration and stomatal conductance, not only within a vine, but also between vines, because this is not just measurements from a single vine, um, you know, and then obviously that has huge implications for drought stress later on in the season and also potential for thermoregulation uh, of the canopy or cooling effect. So I'll show these, these bits of data as well later on. So now looking at um, yeah, leaf chlorophyll or, or uh, leaf N content, nitrogen content, we use a chlorophyll meter. Um, these are actually widely used to guide nitrogen management by monitoring um, leaf nitrogen status. Uh, most of this work is done in staple crops uh, like corn, um, but there are quite a few publications that look at SPAD values uh, in sort of viticulture, and they're significantly they're significantly correlated to leaf N, not only leaf N though, but also to leaf um, uh, phosphorus levels as well. Um, and we mon we monitor this at both bloom and veraison when you normally measure petiole analyses uh, as well, and we do have petiole analyses for certain clients. Um, but the, the leaf nitrogen or the SPAD meter is, is kind of a more quick method of measuring this you know, sort of real time. Um, but we measure at a bloom and veraison because this is approximately when, you know, 40% of nitrogen use in the grapevine occurs, uh, essentially from, you know, fruit set to berry softening is during that window. So before and after uh, we took these measurements. Um, and sort of, sort of similar, what we see in the physical canopy measurements is, is more uniform average leaf chlorophyll content. Um, and this can be directly correlated to higher leaf nitrogen content at a stage when uh, you know, nitrogen, is, nitrogen use is at its highest, really in the grapevine, um, you know, fruit set through, through lag phase. And then now moving on to uh, period three to four, and uh, yeah, this is sort of a critical period three, critical irrigation period for the grapevine, um, you know, which will ultimately determine, you know, sort of when, when, whether the vines are better able to handle their water needs later on in the season. So um, I'm going to start off essentially with the infrared thermography, thermography data. This is taken using a, a FLIR thermal camera. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty rapid, um, it's non-invasive, and uh, there's publications that show it's a pretty reliable indicator of, of canopy temperatures overall. Um, and it can also be uh, correlated to sort of water use efficiency and also uh, overall water usage um, and, and correlated towards you know, heat waves. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, in, in this graph in particular showing a, a roughly a 1.8 uh, degree Fahrenheit average decrease in canopy temperatures measured in the Blue Vitae treatment uh, compared to the control across all the trial sets. Um, so these FLIR, these FLIR cameras uh, essentially produce tens of thousands of data points um, per image, hundreds of thousands of data points for um, essentially uh, an entire trial set. And then moving on from there, uh, Correlating that or calculating stomatal conductance as well as this index, um, you know, stomatal conductance is really related to the opening and closing of the stomata on on the leaves of the grapevine, uh, you know, which is directly related to plant transpiration. 
um, in, the, in the chart that you can see here, um, you know, we see nearly 100% overall average increase in the rates of stomal conductance across uh, the vineyard. Um, you know, and, and really this is kind of correlated to, the, to Blue Vite having on average a larger canopy size with higher rates of transpiration at this um, critical phase. And this, and this allows for a higher cooling effect in the canopy. Um, and because of this, uh, ultimately the vines are better able to, potentially better able to regulate their, uh, regulate their temperature through these heat wave events. Then moving on to period four to five, generally I would talk about um, vine water status in period three, um, but uh, I sort of saved it for period four and I'll kind of discuss why, why we ended up doing that. It wasn't in, really intentional. Um, but really period four is when potassium accumulation generally maxes out. Period five is when bricks generally maxes out. Um, and, then, and then most of anthocyanin evolution will occur uh, in period five from what, from what you saw with uh, Tebow's, Tebow's slides. And so this is um, uh, data from a case study uh, looking at sort of vine water status. Um, and like I said, we generally across our trials will start monitoring um, vine water status in period three. Uh, but this year we started um, monitoring in period four because we, we generally saw a, a delay in water stress conditions. Um, a lot of our trials all have overlapped from 2018, 2019, and 2000, 2020. 2019 and 2020 were very different seasons. Um, and generally we see a much smaller canopy size in 2020 relative to 2019. So the water demand um, was much lower this year uh, in period three. So we didn't start um, monitoring for plant water stress until period four, once the, the vines started showing these um, water stress symptoms. Anyway, that's kind of besides the point. So generally measure this in period three, um, but we started measuring in period four this year. And you can see there's about a 14.3% average increase. Um, so moving towards zero, so less than negative in uh, pre pre dawn leaf water potential in the vineyard areas treated with blue vitae compared to the control. So this this indicates less water stress through throughout the this period of the season. Um, you know, ultimately the treated vines were uh, used more water during peak leaf area due to larger canopy and higher rates of transpiration and photosynthesis, but we do not see an ir increase in irrigation needs. Um, I think this is an important thing to note. So it is important to note really that the irrigation re regimes are kept exactly the same between the treatments. Uh, so vines are on the exact same irrigation schedule throughout the season. So Really, it's because of this increased root biomass that allows for the vine to expo explore a larger soil volume and utilize its existing water resource more efficiently. Um, and because of this, the vine experiences less late season water stress through these drought conditions. Um, and this ultimately has implications for fruit quality parameters like potassium accumulation and uh, anthocyanin development. So moving on from that with potassium, um, and I realized the next couple slides could be an entire presentation. Um, and so I'm going to go through it uh, sort of uh, not, not being, well, just, just being more generalistic about this. And so I do realize that, um, but I think it still gets the point across um, in terms of the data. Uh, you know, potassium channels really are sort of upregulated with late season water stress. You know, studies show this, publications, and this really plays a, a major role in. Uh, uh, potassium like loading into the the berry tissues, so so grapevines may may really will accumulate uh, potassium in clusters to to decrease sensitivity to drought. Um, you know potassium can maintain uh, tissue turgor, rem remedy certain oxidative stresses. So increased drought water stress can actually mean greater cluster potassium levels. Um, and so based on this logic we do see a significant decrease in, in potassium levels in the treated versus the control, which does imply less water stress related to this, uh, less water stress related potassium accumulation. And then moving on from that, looking at berry dehydration, and there's, like Tebow had said, there's a couple of nuances to this. Uh, I will show sugar per berry data in the following slides. Uh, and these calculations are sort of a function of berry volume and sugar concentration. 
I, I, you know, I like to show these along this this data alongside the BRICS data because I, I, I personally don't believe that BRICS tells the full story. Um, you know, because once you know, flum transport transport has ended, any further BRICS increases is really due to water loss or dehydration, uh, not not continued synthesis. So BRICS doesn't really capture the full picture. Um, you know, berry weights can be monitored really to assess the onset of dehydration. Um, you know. Average berry weights will decrease, BRICS increases, but you know, sugar per berry data gives that, that further validation of that assessment. And then here's the berry weight data. So we've got three different time points that I selected. Um, and we see that berry weight sig will significantly, significantly decrease from September 3rd to uh, September 23rd for both treatments. And then from September 23rd to October 12th, Berry weights are more or less maintained in the treated, uh, but they continue to, to decrease in the control. Um, that, there is no statistical statistical difference between the two Blivite treated numbers while there is uh, in the two control numbers at the last two sample points. So a significant decrease in the, in the control, uh, more of a maintenance across time in the, in the treated in the last two sample points. And then we're looking at BRICS here. So in both treatments, there is an increase in BRICS over time, but this there's a more rapid increase in the control versus the treated section. Um, with ultimately prior to harvest, the BRICS maxes out about 29 BRICS in the control and just over 25 in the treated. And so this is really where the sugar per berry by volume is critical in sort of figuring out what's actually occurring um, in the vines themselves. And so you can see here, um, they're across sample points. So from September, the two in September and the one oct in October, there's no statistical difference in the sugar per berry by volume over time in either of the treated or the control. Um, so this is really indicating that bricks, that the increases in bricks are not necessarily due to active sugar loading, but to dehydration. Um, yeah, so, so essentially what we're seeing here is significant decrease in berry weights significant increase in bricks, but the stable and even maybe lower, actually lower in the control, sugar per berry by volume. Um, so this is really indicating that dehydration was more apparent or more characteristic of the control area. Um, and we also see high, like, like I said, we see higher sugar per berry concentrations in the treated prior to harvest, which ultimately implies that the overall synthesis of sugar was higher in the treatment um, through, through time. And then finally, again, like I said, this is, you know, whole whole presentation can be given just on this one aspect, but, um, you know, anthocyanin is hugely important for the quality of wine grapes, um, hugely influenced by late season environmental factors. Um, they also, they're important that they also are heavily influenced by viticultural practices, but um, generally in the trials, uh, canopy management is kept uh, exactly the same between our treatments. So that's just removing one variable here. But generally we see that uh, the treated area, uh, anthocyanin evolution occurred uh, early on uh, and levels were sort of maintained over time. But in the control, the development anthocyanin levels occurred more slowly uh, and never actually reached levels seen in the treated area just prior to harvest. Um, so it does appear that sort of the ripening potential of the blue vitae treated area was higher relative to that, to that of the control. And then, so just uh, wrapping this up here. Uh, so yeah, so this is kind of a bit a busy slide, a little more wordy than my previous slides. But uh, yeah, we see increased root biomass, secondary root production, um, which allows for that high, higher functional root shoot growth, um, functional equilibrium. Um, and we see this in the root biomass in our nursery trials. We also see this in the overall canopy growth in our vineyard trials. Um, you know, increase in bind transpiration small conductance may allow for this better cooling potential during heat waves. And we see this represented in, in our thermal images and also our small conductance analysis. And there is, again, like I know, there is this potential for the vine to use more water due to this generally quote unquote larger canopy because of this higher rate of transpiration. Um, but you know, we're, we're, gener we're actually in some cases re reducing uh, the amount of irrigation that we use. So. Uh, and, and this at the same time, we're seeing reductions in late, seen, late season vine water stress, um, which is you know, supported by this um, 
improvement in sort of root biomass or more importantly, this improved water use efficiency of the grapevines, essentially using its, its existing water resource more efficiently um, is kind of the take home message. And then I guess finally, you know, we see sort of a decrease in, in sort of late season berry dehydration, um, potassium accumulation, and a sort of an early and rapid anthocyanin development um, and, and sort of maintenance of those levels over time, resulting in higher levels of anthocyanins prior to harvest. Um, and this really all can be tied back to that, um, the sort of developments in the canopy as well. So I think those, yep, that's the last of my slides. Um, so yeah, this is sort of the question and answer portion. I know we probably have some uh, questions asked in the uh, actual chat bar. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you wanted to chime in with that. Yeah, um, I, first I wanted to check with Thibaut if you had any final notes, any final uh, recollections on, the, on, on JT's presentation. And then we will get um, into the Q&A session. I see a lot of questions coming up, so there's going to be a lot of, a lot of need for answers. Uh, ju just to circle back with uh, the analytical framework, I, I think uh, JT, yeah, it's it's a very uh, convincing demonstration. Since my understanding is that during P2, the leaf area development is stronger, and this is uh, quantified through uh, shoot length, shoot diameter, shoot uniformity at the end of period two being higher. Then during period three and period four we have cues that there is a higher rate of water use, which implies a greater cooling efficiency of the canopy. During period four, uh, we observe a maximum berry weight, which is higher, and um, the amount of sugar per berry is greater, even if the bricks is lower. And during P5, there is less dehydration, so the, the bricks, that's why they are kept at a lower value, and there is less yield loss. And then as a consequence from that, as expected, during P5, we observe that the color potential is higher. So I think it's a very compelling demonstration, since at each stage of the way, you uh, documented the benefits. So I think it's a very convincing uh, demonstration okay. from my point of view. Well, thanks for that, Thibaut. Um, let's get into our Q&A session now. Thibaut, first, I want you to really briefly describe what a heat wave event is and how you would uh, critically define that. Yeah, uh, a heat wave cannot only be caused by high temperature, because if you have high temperature alongside high humidity, it does not um, disrupt necessarily plant hydraulic integrity. A heat wave needs the combination of high temperature and low relative humidity. For that, there is a, an index called vapor pressure deficit, it's called deficit because it's actually the amount of pressure you need to apply to one unit of air volume to make appear the first droplet of liquid water. So to give you a range, when we are in a wine growing region, when those uh, heat events are frequent, typically plants start to show difficulties in their normal functioning when the VPD reaches 3.5 kilopascal. Then it depends upon varietal, so there is more to that, but just, just to give a big picture. And once you get to four and a half kilopascal. Yeah, go ahead, Diva. Once you get to four and a half kilopascal, then things get exponentially weirder, and that's when we observed those uh, stopping of sugar loading and those dis disorder during fruit ripening. Okay. And Bear in I mind would... that different wine growing regions, we have different thresholds. I just uh, exposed exactly. the ones for California. Yeah, and I was going to uh, note that in the intro slides that we had, the heat wave events, um, I believe those were, were defined at 3.5 uh, kPa as well. Yeah. So um, let's ask this question. Does the lower or higher crop level impact effects at each stage? And I think that's going back to um, your periods of, of development, Thibaut. And I don't know if you want to um, give us a brief answer for this. Yeah, the simple response is yes. Crop okay. load modifies the length of uh, each period. Okay, and um, here is a little bit more of a specific question for you, JT. Has blue vitae been assessed for improved grape quality in vineyards with nematode populations? 
Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I used to do a lot of vineyard development work and, uh, and I, there was, there was never a vineyard where we did, hadn't found nematodes, at least in the North coast. So, um, ultimately, you know, the vineyards that we, we have trials in will have some kind of nematode problem or nematode issue. Um, and some growers are actually uh, assessing this very thing. Um, but almost entirely, uh, yeah, this this data is sort of more uh, internal internal data. Um, you know, so we 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 generally monitor uh, you know effects on the grapevines. We do have genomic studies that we've done looking at overall soil microbial populations. But in terms of uh, like, I'm I'm not sure if this means parasitic nematodes um, or just generally passive or beneficial nematodes. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't specifically drill down how it's affecting nematode populations per se. Okay. And is Blue Vitae approved for organic viticulture? Yeah, so we we are an OMRI listed product. Um, we are approved to work with CCO, vin CCOF vineyards uh, and we have our certifications for the two Blue Vitae original products in, with the CDFA, um, their OIM program. Um, so in California, we're all squared away. Uh, we're currently working with the Washington State of Department of Agriculture to get our organic certifications there as well. Okay. Uh, so, and how long has Blue Vitae been on the market? I think it was said three years in California and six years in Italy. Is that correct? Yeah, six or seven years uh, in Italy, which I believe is the longest. Um, in California, commercially available for for the last two years, um, but we've been running trials with a handful of growers for three years now. Okay. And um, can Blue Vitae be applied to newly planted vineyards? Um, and I guess it's kind of a separate question is at what stage is uh, the product best applied? Yeah, so uh, I say about 25% of all the people who use Blue Vitae um, apply it to, well, I guess in California at least, uh, to newly planted vineyards. So this is one strategy to sort of increase overall rooting biomass of, of an early, of a, of a young vineyard. Um, and so with, with especially young plantings, um, you apply the two applications, the first early season bud break, and then you apply the second application about a month later. Um, when phenological stages are more uh, clear, then you apply it, you know, at bud break and then again at pre-bloom or a flowering. Okay. Yeah. And Tebow, yeah. correct if I'm wrong, but that would be basically period two of your framework and then going into probably period three as well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So how is Blue Vitae applied? Does it run through a drip line? So for the organic product, uh, that's the one that's sprayed on the soil surface. That's the one that's registered organic. We do have a fertigation product as well for areas in which, uh, you know, irrigation might be limited um, or you need to use that water resource more efficiently. Um, we're in the process of getting that organically certified as well. Um, but yeah, there are two products. There's one called Blue Vitae and Blue Vitae Red. That's the original that's um, sprayed on the soil surface um, with a certain volume of water. And then there's the Blue Vitae Easy, which is fertigation. Um, so that's the one that's fertigatable. So yeah, there, we, we do have two products. Okay, cool. And here's a couple of global distribution questions. Um, but who distributes Blue Vitae locally? Uh, so locally is an artist USA. So uh, North America, so um, yeah. United States, Mexico, Canada, that would be an artist USA. Um, in Italy, that would be Blue Agri, who's essentially the, the founders of this, based the ones who created this product. Okay. Uh, and does it have to be ordered directly? Uh, you can, yeah, you can order it. If we, we have a bunch of local sales reps. You can actually order it on our, on our online website. Um, we have, if you need to place an order, you can also contact Blue Vitae at anartis.com. That's little, you can also order it directly from that, um, that email address. So there's, there's a bunch of different ways. Um, but uh, yeah, just you can reach out to me or an Artis USA's team and we can handle that for you. Okay. And then just going back um, to clarify these, these applications, um, is it applied to the soil or directly to the plant? Um, depending on the, the fertigation. Yeah, yeah. So it's 
It's applied to the soil, so it's not a foliar application. Okay. And how much do you think is typically applied? Uh, well, for the easy product, it's about um, four four kilograms. The easy is the fertigation product, four kilograms per hectare um, per application. Uh, and for acres, it's about 3.5 pounds per application per acre. Uh, and then for the uh, traditional product, it's 18 kilograms per hectare or uh, 16.5 pounds um, per uh, per per acre um, per application. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And um, you did really cover this pretty well, I thought, through the presentation. But I, I just wanted to see if there's any follow up comment to Mauricio's co um, question, which is, do you have any evidence of how blue, pay, blue vitae improves berry quality in terms of phenolics uh, or anthocyanins? Yeah. So we've got you know, pretty extensive data, especially with some of our longer standing trials, the three year trials, um, three year trial collaborators, and we we've monitored. Um, uh, phenolic fingerprint, uh, phenolic fingerprint panel, um, all three years to track the improvements in quality. Um, so we have a, a massive data set on this um, from all of our trials that we run, um, and we and and I've actually anonymized quite a bit of that data. And and when we give presentations to clients who are interested in using the product, I include a lot of that data. So um, yeah, we absolutely have that, that that data, and we have a lot a lot of it, a lot more of it than I showed today. Yeah, and I think that's part of the cool cool thing about today's collaboration is that um, there are three years of this study going live, so there's a, there's a lot to review, and it's probably pretty nuanced. Um, but we did sort of just get to the tip of the iceberg <laughs> in terms of answering this question. Yeah, exactly. Um, so does Blue Vitae uh, provide these improvements in years without heat waves, um, or is, a, is this a specific treat wave, uh, treatment for heat wave vintages? Um, no, no. I mean, so I mean, last year was not anywhere near in terms of sort of the the the, the sort of things that were important or prevalent for the season. When we had talked about blue vitae in previous years, it was really about the ability to boost certain quality parameters um, in the fruit, independent of heat waves. Um, this year, we've kind of pivoted because heat waves are so have been so critical um, in terms of how grapes are farmed and also drought too as well. And so we've sort of started talking about our trials and really focusing in on the effects of heat waves and drought in terms of our trials. Um, but you know, years previous, we didn't even really talk about heat waves um, in terms of how the product is um, being, being discussed and how the data is being presented. Yeah, okay. Um, and here's an awesome question from Russell. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit and just see if um, if you can tell me, JT, how the wines turned out from from these trials. Is, is that ongoing? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, we we've got we've had wines made uh, from the different treatments dozens of times. Um, we actually poured uh, Daniel Dow Dow Winery. We actually poured his uh, trial wine at the Win Expo in Santa Rosa. Um, our CEO Jose Santos. Um, actually did a panel on climate change um, when we could all still meet in person, I think 2019 or early 2020 that was, um, we actually poured that wine uh, and there's some pretty stark differences and that was a second year of application, um, especially in terms of tannin structure, especially in terms of overall color of the wines. Um, they were just different wines um, ultimately. Okay. Um, yeah, it'd be really exciting to see more of that as it kind of rolls out and, and the wines are released. Um, and JT, I assume that you would be able to provide somebody who contacted you with, with a reference, right? Um, whether it's in yeah, Napa yeah. or elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a handful of clients that have already um, have already pre-approved, um, you know, whatever discussions with other growers if they want to talk about Blue Vitae without an artist um, sort of through the lens of our trials. So there's this. We have plenty of contacts, especially in, in Napa Valley um, and Sonoma, Sonoma as well. Um, okay. Probably our biggest uh, presence is. Cool. And um, in terms of correlation between blue VT application um, and and water use for folks who have uh, limited supply of water, um, it, this seems like it's probably a whole other webinar. But uh, do you <laughs> want to kind of allude to what you would, how, how you would respond to this question? Yeah. So yeah, this is. Uh, pretty complex um, 
yeah, complex question, but generally we see uh, less water stress in our trials, whatever that, whether that's um, leaf water potential, stem water potential, you know, whatever the client uses to monitor water stress, um, you know, we, we measure that stuff and generally we see less, less of that um, in our, our trials. Keeping that in mind, when we do trials, we do not mess with the irrigation regime. We don't mess with the irrigation schedule. We want to make sure there's not, there's the only variable is the product application. Um, so ultimately we see improvements in water status without increases in irrigation. Um, so this has the implication that the, the vine is uh, utilizing its water resource more efficiently because um, we're not adding more, you know, we're seeing improvements in canopy growth, um, we're seeing improvements in certain ripening quality parameters, but we're not seeing the need for higher water inputs. So this has the implication. We, uh, in a couple of our trials, we do have soil moisture probes we looked at. Um, so, and obviously that data isn't necessarily available to present on, but these are the types of things that growers use to, to look at that as well. Okay. And I see another um, related question, and that is, would Blue Vitae work on dry farm vineyards um, when no pre precipitation is forecasted? Um, will it saturate to the root level uh, if it's only sprayed on the top soil, and, and does it need to be irrigated to work properly? It's a good application question. Yeah, no, it's a yeah, logistical question. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of our wetter climate um, collaborators, they just use a smaller volume of water because you really only, early season, you only really want to get it to the first six inches of the soil where the active roots are at that stage. Um, you know, a lot of our growers in, in the central coast start with, um, they don't start with the saturated soil profile, so they have to use a higher volume of water. So it's a difference of between, you know, 40, 40 gallons per acre or 100 gallons per acre in terms of application volume. So it's just, it, that's more of a logistical thing than, um, than, than anything else. Okay. And going back to um, wine quality or finished wine, uh, question of finished wine quality, what is the NPK composition of, of Blue Vitae? Right. Yeah, so, so Blue Vitae is um, elemental sulfur, uh, magnesium sulfate, and yeast protein hydrolysates or yeast hydrolysates, which are essentially amino acids. Um, so there's this very small uh, organic nitrogen component. I think it's like 0.3% or 0.03%. It's, it's below a percent. Um, so that gives you an idea. It doesn't significantly in add nitrogen to the soil system. Okay. Um, and does the product merely stimulate existing populations of soil microbes? thereby requiring uh, a decent initial population, or does it contain an inoculum for soils that might be lacking? I thought this would probably co-align with, with the research you guys have been working on um, in terms of soil microbiology, right? Yeah, yeah, so it's, we're not, we're, there, there's no inoculum. It's not, um, it's not like, a, a, like a bug in a jug um, sort of product where you're trying to introduce a, a certain strain um, into like a foreign or alien strain into the soil system. We're purely trying to stimulate the ecosystem that is there. Um, if you can, if you can influence certain key microorganisms within the soil system, you can actually shift the functionality of that system towards a purpose, which is ultimately the the growing of grapevines. And so that's that's ultimately the the difference between something like this and a compost tea is we're trying to work with with what's already there, whereas a compost tea is trying to introduce something beneficial into the system. Okay. Um, and here is a, a good question that I think is going to probably um, uh, go along lines with, with Tebow's interest as well, but um, has there been a significant uh, difference in harvest states between treated and control vines? Oh, um, I mean, it's hard to speak in generalities with this one because every sort of trial soil situation is very different. Um, Generally, in our trials, we encourage growers to harvest at the same time because we want to be able to compare the wine ultimately. Um, <clears throat> but if you think about it, if there's certain quality parameters that aren't meeting certain criteria during the season, um, you might have to delay harvest in the control versus the treated um, because there is certain delays. Also, if you see um, bricks going 
rapidly increasing while anthocyanins are basically staying the same, then you might need to harvest to anticipate increasingly higher bricks. So that would be a case where you'd harvest the control sooner than the treated. So it's it's case per case, I, I would think, you know, um, it's hard to speak in generalities. Yeah, and, and you know, so maybe you want to talk a little bit about cause, causation or causality, um, causal relationships? No, uh, I don't have much things to, to add on top of what uh, Jake said. Okay. Yeah, it's a very complex issue that I think uh, at least our company has, has been working on on a global level um, as well as trying to figure all this out. So um, here's a probably more specific question, but can Blue Vita be applied uh, alongside mycorrhiza? Mycori yeah, so we so part of our genomic studies, we've, we see um, uh, statistically significant increases in both alpha and beta diversity of soil microorganisms. Um, and that that includes both fungal and bacterial populations. So this works uh, alongside um, any sort of beneficial fungal or bacterial populations that exist in that soil. So yeah. the short answer is yes. Okay, cool. Um, and then I see two separate um, questions on uh, distribution. And um, one is, is it available in, in BC? Unfortunately, it's not uh, currently registered uh, for sale in Canada. Um, although okay. we're, we, you know, we're we're working towards that for sure. And um, in terms of Colorado and Arizona, is it is it available? And if not, how can we get it registered? Yeah, so that's that's we're working towards that. You know, because it's a uh, it has to be registered with each. Department of Agriculture, it's not like a herbicide or a pesticide that just gets registered with the EPA and then you can kind of clean your hands and say that was that's all we needed. It has to be registered with each state. So as demand increases um, in certain states is when we'll invest in sort of registering the product in those in those states. Um, uh, Canada is one of our top priorities. Um, Arizona is also one of those priorities as well. So I'm sorry, does uh, Canada for each province, is it a separate um, I think for Canada, process. it's different. I think you can register with the whole country okay. um, as opposed to individual provinces, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and so any effects on stem um, lignification or seed hardening? Uh, we, I have not collected any data on seed hardening in California. I, I can't speak for Blue Agri um, and their Italian trials. Um, yeah, so I can't really speak to that aspect. Um, but looking at lignification of the canes, we have looked at that um, improvements in sort of overall lignification of, of the canes at the end of the season. In terms of lignification of the actual rachis, which I maybe think is what they're talking about, um, that's something else we haven't really studied in depth. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the answer to that. Okay, well, I think we have one last question. Um, and that is looking at cost per acre. So we get down to that bottom line. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's uh, just about, it's under $100 uh, per application per acre, and you do two applications per year. So okay. that gives you an idea. Um, there's obviously, there's some difference in prices between the two, the fertigation product and the traditionally applied product. Traditionally applied product is, is the one that's sprayed on the soil surface. And that one's a little cheaper because there's the added cost of having to uh, uh, factor in tractor passes and whatnot. So the fertigation product's a little bit more. A little different. Cool, okay, well, um, I wanted to thank everyone for their questions and, and posting all the questions uh, either in the Q&A box or the, the public chats. I hope we got to everything. Um, if not, I know that JT and his team are awaiting your questions um, and I'm sure you can be emailed on um, through the through the Inaris website um but yes and and thank you everyone who joined us um we really appreciate you taking the time to learn with us and i wanted to thank uh both Thibaut and jt for your uh time on putting together these presentations i thought it went really well um but thank you both thanks, thank you thanks so much all right well thank thanks everyone once again we hope to see you next time at one of our events um, and we will be in, in contact. Thank you. Okay. Ciao, ciao.